Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we gather around God's word, as we hear what he has done for us and then sing our praises and listen to his word. Our stewardship theme, our stewardship series is continuing. We're in week two. Last week we looked at what contentment is and now we're going to be looking at what storing up is or saving up. Our order of service will be page 38 in the front of the hymnal. We'll begin with our call to worship with our gathering rite. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. commands make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers. How sweet are your words to my taste. is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Yet so often we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross for all your sins, and rose again 
to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your one and only Son as the word of life for our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Help us believe what the scriptures proclaim about him and do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from Isaiah chapter 6. Here we see God's call of Isaiah and the message that, that God wanted him to proclaim. But notice what Isaiah first has recognition of. He first sees that he is unworthy of such a calling. He is not the one that lives up to God's standard. But God does the almighty thing. God does what wouldn't be expected of someone speaking to a sinner. God actually cleanses Isaiah of the message, and now Isaiah is fitted and ready and eager to do God's work. What a wonderful call we have received. A blessing that comes to us because we have done nothing for it. God shows us what we are and then shows us what he has done. We are in the same position as Isaiah. Listen to our first lesson. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 85. It's found on the screen or in your hymnals on page 95.
Our second lesson this morning comes to us from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 14. The Apostle Paul puts on display that receiving and getting and partaking of the Holy Spirit and his work moves us to use what he has given for the glory of his kingdom. That means among others and taking care of one another. Listen now to our, our second lesson. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, Stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. This is the word of God. Our verse of the day. Alleluia. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Alleluia. <laughs> Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 5. We read, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and I haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners, then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn. That's hymn number 93.
Grace and peace are yours in abundance to the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. There it is. There's the words. Sometimes they seem scary. Sometimes they seem like a pie in the sky. Sometimes they seem like a way of life. How do you view saving up? It's no secret that in today's culture, in American society, saving up is a challenge. The world around us tells us to get what we want when we want it, to get as much as we can so that we'll be okay. I could even use an analogy from playing video games. How quickly do you want to get all the best equipment? How quickly do you want to dominate and get to the end? How quickly do you want to show others how much more you have? But it doesn't just relax or rely on video games. What about all the tools or all the equipment that you store up that you're going to need for this or that? Maybe it's the crafting projects. I know I'm going to need that extra yard of fabric. I'm going to need those extra pieces someday. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's an idea that if I have all the inventory I need, I'm going to be better off than if I have to wait to get it later. You know, that's a time-tested sales, sales use that you have to get it now because you might not be able to get it later. Better get it so that you're, you're certain that it's all there. It's probably not going to be on sale. And besides, the sale price is better than getting it later on. No wonder it's so difficult for us to view saving up as something that is pleasing to God. What about in how you go about your life in sharing what God has done or given for you? Is saving up even a challenge in how you do good things for others? Does it come that, that maybe the time isn't right that I, can, that I can use my time and talents because I've got so much stuff that I want to do? I've got this or that going on. I'll get to it eventually. I'll be the one that helps out when, when I've built up enough time. Maybe it has nothing to do with possessions. Maybe it's about what I do with the time I'm given. We can see the ramifications of such ways and thoughts when, when people in our society build up debt to the point that all they're doing is hoping to make it paycheck to paycheck. In fact, the Wall Street Journal even reports that 70% of Americans are in that kind of dilemma. We can see it in a congregation when, when it's only the usual that always show up to help out because people have so much stuff going on, they need to get it in. Where's saving up? Where's making ourselves available to use for God's kingdom? In fact, another illustration came to me when I was working on my sermon. I had a bag of beef sticks sitting on my desk from Jones's. It's really good stuff. <laughs> oh, man, can't get enough. How many of you would take bets that I decided to eat the entire bag because it was sitting in front of me right there? Things are easy for us to get at a moment's notice. We find ways so that we make ourselves feel good, don't we? I want everyone to attend, spend their time on what I think is important because I don't know how much time I'm going to have. Maybe it's a plan to make use of that amount for a later time, but then I miss out on all the places and times that God has given to me right here and now. Think of how many stories of regret for those that have worked so much, so quickly, so hard, that their family doesn't even know them anymore. 
In fact, it's not too far out of the way that we see people that are willing to kill their spouse or their parents just so that they can get the inheritance or insurance money now and get themselves out in one big swoop. Or how many people spend more money and try to take a chance at putting that money for one big hitting the jackpot. That's a human condition. That's a human desire that lies within each one of us to some extent. And whatever we're doing to save up, we're always looking for ways that bring ourselves pleasure. In fact, we get upset when other people ask us to set aside time for them. Just mentioning saving up can cause you some guilt. Just mentioning saving up causes us to get defensive. To start feeling guilty about what I did or didn't do. How often do we look at those times? It's far easier to get ourselves caught up into it even more, isn't it? The devil wants us to say, well, just keep working at it for yourself. And you'll be okay because if you keep on trying, at least you're better off than someone else. Build houses that are bigger because you're going to use them at some point. Get all the furnishings you can because that's when they're on sale. Build up your inventory. How many businesses have you heard of that were so intent on rapidly expanding that they were building up credit to get more credit and then the employees suffer because the jobs go away. What I want you to look at and what I want you to hear is not all of the good financial guru's advice. And there's a lot of it out there. Some of it is very practical. Saving for yourself first. Setting aside the nest egg making sure you have cushion for what might possibly happen. What I want you to do is I want you to listen to Jesus' words here in our text. Listen to what Jesus puts the focus on, on where we put our treasure. What is our goal when we look to use what God has given and even saving up for him? The first few verses from our text. Taken from Luke chapter 12. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in an abundance of his possessions. Then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say that being rich is wrong. He doesn't say that having a lot of blessings is evil. He says, look at what your hearts are set on. What brings you comfort? What gives you pleasure? Is it how many things that you have built up or the, the pleasure or the, the, the stuff that is there for later? Notice that Jesus says this is a heart matter. Doing things so that I can please myself, so that I can get the most that I can out of this life for the time being right now, 
is actually one that jeopardizes our soul. Oh, I'll wait till later. I'll give when I have enough. And so we spend even more to try to get ahead. So we spend even more on ourselves or on others so that they make or so that they feel glad around us, so that we can please others by how much that we're spending or showing to them. It doesn't even have to be and done in such a manner with possessions. Maybe it's a desire to to get so far ahead that you go out and date so that you can get to the end result because you can't wait or you want something now. What are you saving up for? Do I want what I've got here and now so that I feel nice and content and happy? Or am I looking for what God has given to me to use or to put towards his kingdom? But it's not a lesson about money. It's a message about being blessed by God and how we use those blessings. Jesus says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Where do you find your time and your pleasure in? Is it in serving others? Using that for God's kingdom? Or is it an acquaintance with God that makes it feel like I've got something accomplished? sad truth is that we love to look at ourselves. It's easy for us to spend now if that means I'm at least feel better about it for the time being. I don't care about the results or the consequences. Some people even define their jobs that way. Well, I'm doing this because it's going to get me more in the end. Or, this is the only thing I can do because it's the easiest for me at the time. The list goes on and on and on and on, so much so that the society sells it to us. Get it while it's hot. Get it because you really need it or you will need it and it won't be on sale anymore. You're saving money by spending it now. God's not interested in the amount that we're giving in the offering plate. He's interested in what we have in our hearts. And so we make that comparison. Where am I standing before God when I'm looking at myself It's a very dismal picture. You see, besides saving up possessions or abilities or time, we've actually been saving up a lot of pleasure. We've been saving up a lot of focus, so much so that the debt that we owe to God is overwhelming. There's nothing that is going to get us out of this predicament. When we see that, we see an amazing thing. An incredible focus that shifts God from seeing what we have not done to sending his son to pay our debt. He doesn't take from what gives him pleasure. In fact, he gives what gives him pleasure. He gives his own son so that he can shed not credit, but his life. When the debt of ours is overwhelming, God gives the most precious resource that he has, and he gives his life blood. For you and for me.
those who do the least with what he's given. That's the impact of the songs we sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Rock of ages, cleft for me, a mighty fortress is my God. Those are songs about a God who has rescued us from absolute bankruptcy. He gives us a future that is not built on what we accumulate or some kind of status or things that we have to have. He builds us a future completely on what he has done for us. He gives us worth. Saving up. Is it really about all the things that we can attain? Or is it what Jesus has given to us so that we might also share and benefit the kingdom? Is it about how much I have in reserve or is it about what Christ has given to me out of his absolute treasure? Beautiful Savior. Amazing grace, rock of ages. You see, saving up is a wonderful privilege. It means fully investing in what it is Christ has done for us so that my status, my opportunity to help is, is not about what comes out of my pocket or my time, but what it is that Christ has given to me. Look at verses 22 and 23. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. See, this even affects our mindset. Why am I worried about all the things that I'm trying to accumulate when I know that God is the one who promises to take care of each and every one of those things? Is it great if I have a lot? Isn't it just as great if I have a little? So that what I use and what I have is saving up for the kingdom of God, is making use of that amount so that God receives the glory. Maybe that is accumulating and having wealth on hand to help out. Maybe it's making sure that I'm not taking by surprise so that my giving is the one that takes the blow. Maybe it's just as simple as willing to be able to smile and encourage others because I know that my God has given me so much. How do you view saving up? The end result of this lesson is not so that St. Paul has flush with ability to pay and do things. It's not even so that we are all happy, well, members here in this church. It is in seeing the great storehouse that we've been given by God. In fact, that's how God points it out to the people of Israel in Malachi, isn't it? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. This isn't a law. This isn't something that calculates what you get. Put in 20, get out 40. What it is, is a heart motivation. Respond to what God has given to you so that, so that that message can be multiplied and shared. Look to see what God has given you, whether it's time or talent. So that it's not about my time or my plans or my schedule or my resources, 
but about what God has given and look at what he can do with that. Saving up, that's often a very difficult or challenging thing. In fact, it's sometimes scary if we have to look at ourselves and see all the failures that we've made along the way. Maybe the first advice we would ever give to our younger self is don't spend that. What all that does is create fear. It leads us to hoarding as much as we possibly can and getting the best deal on things. But instead, when we look at the treasure that we have, let's store it up. Let's store it up so that it can be used for God's kingdom. Let's store it up so that others will also benefit. Utilize the means that you have to get yourself out of debt of others so that you can give the debt of love. How wonderful and glorious it is when saving up isn't measured about what I have to do, but what I'm pleased to do because I've been given so much. Amen. Please stand. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Our response to the message from God's word this morning is to confess our faith. We'll confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We'll gather our offerings, and we will also see the Wells Connection on the screen. Please stand for prayer. Lord of our lives, by sending your Son to live and die as our perfect substitute, you provided forgiveness and salvation for a world of sinners. We praise you for your generous saving love. We thank you for reaching out to each of us personally with your word and the water of baptism. You have set us apart as people who belong to you, people whose purpose in life is to receive your love and to live to your glory. Gracious Father, remind us that you have called us to live for you and not for ourselves or according to the standards of the world. Help us devote our time, our talents, our energy, and whatever you have placed into our hands to those things that will be of value for eternity. Help us to love you and others and to use things as you desire instead of loving things and trying to use you and others for our own selfish desires. May our hearts belong to you completely so that our lives can be devoted to things that really matter. Bless all who are suffering or in need. Be with the lonely and the grief-stricken. Move us to use the unique gifts you have given each of us to bring comfort and help to those who need it. Bless the government and the church, and make us blessings to both. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Crush the selfishness that comes to us naturally and fill us with joyful generosity. Grant that the gifts we bring to you may show that we are just as diligent and just as interested in carrying out your business as we are in carrying out our own. We dare to ask all this, Father, not because we deserve to ask it, but because of your Son has earned for us the right to approach you as your dear children. Amen.
And now hear us, Lord, as we pray boldly and confidently as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, Christ the Life of All the Living. We'll sing verses 1 and 2, and then 6 and 7. We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure heart, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
We'll close with our final hymn.